thank you very much for your uh, invitation to return to the school. Uh, I enjoy coming here for many reasons to meet students from uh, all over the place, Spain, but also, of course, from South America. And uh, when I s first started teaching here, I think it was in the year 2000, uh, it was my first introduction to South American architecture. Since then, I've visited Argentina, Chile, uh, Peru, and Brazil, and I, th I find it um, very important what you do here at the school to be a kind of a bridge between the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere, to be a center of knowledge, and to attract uh, talented young South American architects as well as talented young, maybe not so young, Spanish architects. <laughs> so it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a theory of architecture. Um, and the reason why I'm going to talk about this is uh, this is the first presentation of what uh, I have worked on for quite a few years. So it's not a midterm review, it's a first, uh, first term review. Um, I've always been asked by people who are not architects, um, should, we, should we judge architecture and uh, or should we just keep quiet? When projects get built, when um, expensive uh, competitions are run, uh, when smaller scale projects are being constructed just around the corner, should we just accept what people are building? And as architects, should we have the right to criticize our colleagues? Very, very tough question. What should we say to our friends, our colleagues, uh, uh, architect friends? Uh, Eduardo Suto de Moura is a very close friend of mine. Um, I criticized his project before it was designed, or before it was built, but he didn't take any interest in my comments and so uh, the Baraga football stadium was constructed um, in my view it's not a good football stadium it may be an excellent use of concrete but it's not a good football stadium and many footballers who play here find the atmosphere uh, problematic because at the ends of the pitch there is nothing there's either a void or there is a uh, mountain I remember when uh, at the European Championships 2004, German com uh, television commentators uh, interviewed a football player who had scored a goal. And he, s he asked this football player, well, what was it like? And the football player said, well, I was running and running, and there was no reaction. <laughs> so, you know, the uh, atmosphere is an important quality in architecture. And some architects are willing to sacrifice atmosphere and character because they're interested in certain issues, very personal issues. What should we say to our enemies? Um, what should we say to Rem Kolhas? Um, I think this is an interesting cartoon. It says, of course, the very, uh, this is Rem Kolhas being interviewed. Of course, the very idea of the architect as a megastar is intrinsically absurd. And the interviewer says, oh, well, of course, of course. So how do we judge architecture? And um, I'm beginning this presentation, um, or ha I have started thinking about all of this because I offered a seminar in architectural criticism for quite a few years. And uh, as I've tried to become more and more precise about the methodology, the tools, the framework, uh, I have come to a point where it's no longer just a, a question of drafting a theory of architectural criticism. It's important to talk about what is architectural theory. We don't really have the tools for uh, judging architecture. This is one comment I would uh, have. Um, we need an integrate, integrated and holistic approach, especially today where 
there are so many other conflicting interests in the field of architecture. So I'm presenting to you a structure of a theory of architecture. Uh, you may ask, do we need another theory? Um, yes, we do, because the existing theories are not addressing the important issues. So if we think about the global issues, there are, OK, sustainability. And uh, this is uh, quite a helpful diagram to expose the interest by those who are talking about sustainability. OK, there are these three uh, areas, the social, the economic, and the environment. And whenever you have them uh, overlapping, you have certain kinds of uh, desirable fields, whether it's viable uh, when you have positive uh, economic and environmental uh, solutions, you have something that is viable. And when all these three intersect, you have something that is sustainable. Um, there's no discussion about when, when you look at this word environment, this is where architecture would fall, right? But there's no discussion about quality or qualities, right? So the danger is that we are only, once again, we're only looking at this area in terms of sustainability. We're looking at the life cycle analysis. We're looking at the number crunching, right? A lot of architects and engineers are interested, when they're interested in sustainability, they're interested in this thing because this is the objectifiable aspect. This is where you can talk about money, CO2 emissions, toxic emissions, etc. But we do not talk about durability, character, and the building's contribution to the environment and to the users. These are not included. And how can you talk about sustainability if you're only talking about the numbers of the existing object, but you're not saying how many years this building can survive? If the building is constructed with normal materials, it will have a life cycle a life expectancy of maybe 45, 50 years, maybe 60 years. But if it's durable beyond 60 years, if it's flexible, then it has maybe twice the life. It has 120 years. And that changes the equation in terms of life cycle analysis by 100%. Right? So if we don't talk about these things, how easy it is to adapt a building, how easy it is to reuse the interior of a building, we miss out large values of sustainability. And if we don't talk about uh, the quality of the building in terms of what a building, how a building um, engages people, how people find a building a positive experience, we, we lack the discussion about the support that the general public will give to an existing building. There are many ugly buildings. Many people hate ugly buildings. And those ugly buildings of the 60s, 70s, and 80s get knocked down. Right? It's a big problem, because we have many ugly buildings. And we cannot afford to allow all those things to be knocked down. It's a very simple problem in sustainability. Anyway, so. We have to transform uh, the urban fabric. We have to design appropriately uh, for the existing environment. Some specific issues. We have to deal with individual projects, new projects. We have to analyze individual new projects, not from the point of view only of life cycle, life cycle analysis, but from the point of view, as I've tried to suggest, also from the other qualitative points of view. We have to transform the existing fabric, uh, and we have to deal with conservation. Um, the current situation is that we have inherited, and as architects, we have contributed to the legacy of modernist architecture, which inherently has constructed segregated urbanism. Uh, it's a mechanistic production, and uh, there's a dominance of uh, technology. 
And as a result, uh, modern architecture has alienated the general public. I, I think that you have yourself experienced discussing with your friends and colleagues who are not architects what they think of modern architecture. And I think that most of them don't like modern architecture. That's my experience. So if the current um, framework is to design sustainable architecture, how are we going to address suburban condition? Uh, we see lots of publications on green uh, uh, architecture. Most of it, interestingly, deals with a further suburbanization. Right? You have to think about this. It doesn't make sense. Um, in the global co context, so we are dealing with agri-industry right? everywhere. Spain is included. Uh, Germany, dioxin scandal. Uh, we're dealing with corporate technocracy. This is a trading floor uh, of a bank in Switzerland. And we're dealing with the results of consumer society. Yes. So, but that's a kind of a, the, the global context and the specific context. And to us ourselves as professionals, what we have to do is we have to clean up our own act. We need to define what we mean by architecture. Is it just the house? that we control for a young couple with uh, children and two cars? Is, is that all we're going to deal with? Or are we concerned about the general discussion that the politicians are holding with regard to what architecture is, what the environment is, how we deal with uh, CO2 control, etc.? Do we leave out the issue of sustainability and we just pursue our little things uh, as architects? We do, you know our little niche projects. So we need to define what we mean by what is acceptable quality. Vitruvius has already defined it. I think it's still very useful. Uh, you could say it's an early version of sustainability. So uh, these are the words uh, briefly of introducing the context. Let me talk about how I see um, architecture theory and practice. The theory that I'm going to uh, suggest to you is structured in these three areas. Uh, a descriptive method, an, an analytical method, and an evaluative method. So these three are linked. And you have on the practical side, uh, the definition of elements, uh, synthesis, how these elements are brought together, and what they mean. And, uh, you could sort of translate that into more common uh, uh, grammatical terms, if like that. If you like. But these two things are connected uh, by these ways. So, First of all, we need a descriptive method, because there isn't one in architecture. Comes uh, uh, as a surprise, maybe, to some of you, but we do not have a descriptive method. Um, and the descriptive method, I'm just running down the contents in these uh, 20 text slides, so that you get a structure of a theory of architecture. First of all, how do we identify anything at all? How do we recognize things? This is an issue of cognition. We have various ways of organizing what we recognize. There are morphological types in architecture. There are morphological elements. And there are morphological categories. So that's the descriptive method. The analytical part deals with the relationships of the elements to each other. Rhetorical relationships. I will explain that. Semantic relations. And then there's the evaluative aspect, where we have three different points of view. 
Uh, we're going to talk about what are qualities, uh, what is, uh, what, what constitutes meaning, and how we actually evaluate things. So, this is the structure for the theory. Um, let me go into the first component, the descriptive method. Please do not misunderstand description for prescription. Many students fear that when you describe something, they think that, that the theory is telling you what to do. It's not the case. Vitruvius, uh, uh, Vignola, and all those people, they defined what the orders were. It was a form of prescription. This is not about that. So how do we I identify anything at all? Uh, this is a flat fish uh, at the bottom of the seawater. See the eyes. We identify things because uh, things are differentiating themselves from a context, from a background. It's a figure ground difference. So there's an act of differentiation, maybe more uh, clearly, it's a footprint in the sand. Uh, we see a figure against the ground. We can talk about dominant and sub subdominant aspects. These will all need to be further defined, but I'm just introducing these essential uh, categories of what constitute cognition. And then there's the relationship of part to whole, a very important uh, concept uh, that will recur um, in the definition of the terms. So what is an object at one uh, order of perception can become an element in the next uh, higher level of perception. And it's a very important notion that these levels of perceptions are interconnected, but that we have the ability to switch from one to the other. So for instance, when, when you, you are able to focus, when you're in front of a football uh, pitch, you're, in, you're able to focus on the overall pitch as a big, big shape. As you approach it, you're able to identify individual grass blades. Right? So the grass blades are the elements of the whole. Right? But as you focus on it more closely, the grass blade becomes the whole. Right? So this is a kind of part whole uh, phenomenon that we are always able to switch between. The cognitive variables, uh, there are those of uh, how well things are defined in terms of the, the parts, these parts, and the overall shape. So here we have a shape that is fairly well defined with circul circular elements that are also clearly defined. Here's a shape that's not so well defined with elements that are clearly defined and the variables in between. Um, a group of things can be heterogeneous or homogeneous. Here's a group of uh, homogeneous circles. Here's a group of completely different shapes. And then there are different kinds of uh, mixtures. We can arrange objects in a different way. In an open line, in a closed line or circle, in a star or a ringed star. There are different forms of repetition, seriality, rhythm. Uh, we can talk about profile shape, form, gestalt, and icon. We can talk about the profile of uh, these elements. We can talk about the appearance, the form, and we can define these things in geometric terms. Um, there is a typology. You can have a typology of curves, of complex shapes, as there is in the case of uh, ancient Greek vases. And there are uh, reversal phenomena in terms of uh, uh, gestalt. 
We can talk about scale, dimension, and proportion. We can talk about mass, weight, material, surface, and color and reflectivity. So these are the eight cognitive variables. There are four basic geometric types of uh, volumes, point, line, plane, and the volume. And as part of the uh, research that I was uh, doing many years ago, there is an ability for us to define things more or less precisely in the relationship between name, concept, and geometric de definition. So in this array of shapes, these pieces here would be called pillars, uh, whereas this element here, the end, mm -hmm. would not be called a pillar because it's too short. It's called a block. And as these elements become longer and longer, you would no longer talk of it as a pillar. Or when is it a pillar, a pier, and then a wall? Uh, when is it a pillar and a pier? When is it a buttress? When is it an upstand or a balustrade or a wall? So these things are, it's possible to be relatively precise about the use of our terminology. So we can have a list of elements and uh, a group of elements in terms of categories. And there are five categories morphological categories, construction, tectonic, compartment, configuration, and context. Um, construction, when you bring elements of uh, the category of con uh, construction together, they form uh, a whole, and the whole is then an element of the next category of tectonics, so we uh, end up with a wall. And if you bring two elements of the tectonic together, uh, or more, you uh, create a space. And as you add a number of these spaces together, you get a, a configuration. And as you add configurations together, you get a contextual element. And uh, there are different elements that you can identify in each of these uh, relating to point, line, plane, and volume. Uh, in construction, and tectonics, and compartments, and configurations, and the context. So the analytical part. We can talk about morphological relations. And there, it's important to talk about the coherence, integrity, and inner logic of uh, the parts to each other. We can look at uh, different kinds of relationships, whether it's parts to parts or parts to whole. And wholes to each other. The semantic relations. The relation between a concept that generates an architectural design, the intention behind it, the program, and then the, the actual design. We look at the content and the meaning and the performance and other associations. We can have deductions and inductions if an architect hasn't written about uh, something, a design. And we can talk about things in critical terms, uh, written, spoken, or built. Rhetorical relations. There are two types of rhetorical figures. One is the figure of composition, and the other is the figure of conception. This is taken uh, directly from uh, rhetorical treatises, and I think it's possible to apply some of those terms, some of the, those uh, notions to architecture. For instance, the notion of suppression in the relationship between the part to the whole, uh, in this case of the Doric order, we have blocks of different heights 
And as a way of playing over or suppressing the different uh, heights of these elements, um, the Doric order has both entices as well as fluting. The fluting is such that you are almost unaware of the joints. Right? So the detailing that is being used, the way that the overall form of the shaft is developed, uh, is undergoing the rhetorical figure of composition of suppression. Right? You do not see these individual components uh, in, the, in the ideal state. Right? This is taken from the Parthenon, uh, where things are being replaced one after the other and others are left as a ruin. So you can see that these components are literally are of different dimension. And in modern terms, you could look at uh, this service door here in the museum by Morgan and Degelo in Liechtenstein. And you can say that this door, uh, you could say, is completely integrated in the facade. That's one way of uh, expressing it. But you could also say, um, that the architects are using the rhetorical figure of composition of suppression. They're suppressing its identity. Right? And so you could take this further by analyzing buildings in terms of how well they integrate themselves into the context or how, how strongly they set themselves apart from the context by analyzing uh, things, relationships of this kind. And um, to the third and uh, most important part of the structure, the evaluation. We, we could identify three points of view, or if you like, two, but at, at least three. The first one is the subjective point of view. We each have different experiences. Uh, we have preferences. Uh, we have different uh, states of knowledge, uh, and that is never to be um, uh, changed. We have, therefore, subjective points of view. We look at things from specific uh, vantage points. But we also have an ability to discuss things uh, discursively. We could say, what would this building look like if, uh, or what would this space be uh, if uh, this brick uh, weren't here, if this were covered in textile, if this were covered in a purple uh, mm, uh, felt, what quality would this space uh, have? What quality of this space uh, would this space have if we had exposed beams across uh, the ceiling as opposed to a dropped ceiling? Uh, and we can play through these things in our minds without giving up either a subjective point of view, uh, but also uh, without giving up the possibility of engaging each other in a discussion. And it's an en enriching way of talking about what if. And then there's a third uh, point of view, which is what I would call the imminent point of view. I don't want to use the word objective, although it is the thing itself, the object itself, that would be analyzed. The imminent point of view is everything that the descriptive method is able to talk about, identify. We talk about qualities, very important uh, aspect. Um, we talk about assembly. We talk about the way things are put together, right? Um, articulation. Why bother? having any columns in this space at all? Why are we articulating this space? Why are we articulating uh, the drop ceiling? Um, there is a reason behind it. We can talk about those things. We can talk about methods of assembly, technique. We can talk about durability of parts of the whole and um, uh, of, of the parts and the whole. We can talk about the life expectancy of the brickwork of the linoleum, of the electrical system, of the lighting system, etc. 
and we find out that these things have different life expectancies. We can talk about performances. How does a building perform? What kind of performances does the building um, generate amongst the users? We can talk about functions, life cycle analysis. We can talk about flexibility and adaptability. We can say how easy it is for a building to be adapted. We as architects have the experience to say that. There are very few other people who can say that. We can talk about ambience and character. Normally we don't talk about ambience. We don't talk about character. Right? But most people, lay people, will be able to say when they see a design of yours made out of concrete with steel, they'll be able to say uh, it's going to have that kind of character, isn't it? Um, uh, meaning. A building, any building, has a character of reality. This is uh, uh, an Austrian uh, art historian's term, Dagobert Frey, who says, every work of art, everything that we create as humans, has uh, a way of creating a world by implication. So if you have a, if you have a piece of technology, such as a, a mobile phone, it's, it says something about beyond uh, its, its object quality, it also has an ambition to change the world or to create a world, a network, a communicative network, right? And a building has the same ambition as uh, a piece of technology. It, it has the ambition to change the world, to create a, a one part of reality, but by implication, if you were to follow the same rules that generated this building, it would have implications for the rest of the world. Right? So notion of the character of reality, uh, what is the world view that is being expressed by the building? What is its style? Right? Modernist, functionalist, blah, 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 those kinds of things. So these, are, these are big summary terms. And then we finally come to evaluation. Um, we can identify significant moments that a building has. We can say also there are some very conventional things about a building. The way this, this brickwork is laid out is very conventional. Right? But the way that uh, there is a, a circulation space, the way this architect here tried to combine a reference to the Doric right, with this fluting and the modern uh, the Corbusian language uh, tried to use both the, uh, the brickwork of uh, something more vernacular uh, with kind of a, uh, metallic window frames. Uh, this architect was trying to synthesize different uh, uh, value systems. And that's you could say, is a significant moment in this building. You can also identify internal and external contradictions. Um, it's the, the, the columns here are about trabeation. It says, you know, it's about uh, vertical supports and horizontal beams. But where are the horizontal elements? You could say that this is a kind of a moment of weakness uh, and so on. But most importantly, the theory uh, and practice of, our, uh, or the, uh, the theory and practice of analysis and evaluation should not be exhaustive. There's no point in identifying every single element in a building and taking into account how well or how badly something is being put together, what the internal or external contradictions are. The point about criticism and evaluation is that one should be able to home in on the most important issues that the building raises. At the time of the design, at the time of construction, and maybe some years later. And so I finished this presentation with uh, a view um, of Alva Altos Villa Maria. My students have heard this presentation uh, some weeks ago. 
Villa Maria was built for some very wealthy Finnish uh, couple, uh, Harry and Myra uh, Gullikson, and it's set inside this uh, wooden part of uh, mid middle Finland. It's a U-shaped uh, building with a swimming pool, a sauna, an external dining area, uh, a three-sided uh, garden, and uh, a service wing, an in interior dining room, uh, bedrooms above, um, living room below, entrance here, kitchen uh, at ground level, and a uh, um, painting studio of Mara Gullis. Um, and the synthetic criticism says that Alva Aalto tried to summarize in one building everything that he believes about the development of civilization. So civilization begins in the wild and creates a, a kind of a precinct with some basic elements, water, earth, here's an earth mound, fire, uh, and food, and this is a grass roof, and uh, as the building uh, ascends to its climax, which is the painting studio, the painting studio is the uh, zenith of civilization. Civilization has developed its most uh, highest forms of thinking and uh, existence in art, and that is the uh, celebration and culmination point of the Villa Maria. So you begin with uh, earth, uh, water, fire uh, in the ground, and you end up in this world of concepts and uh, of creation. Um, and if you apply the same kind of thinking, of an analytical thinking to another building of Alva Alto, the cultural center of 1950s in Wolfsburg, you begin to understand that this, this plan is not uh, such a uh, compressed uh, piece of incompetence as uh, Dimitri Porfirios, uh, writer on Alva Alto, has suggested. It's not a kind of a disordered uh, plan at all, because there is a very clear way by which people who uh, live in uh, Wolfsburg would have used this place. So as a child, you might have started by using the children's library and external children uh, reading area. You might have used the club facility down here. This is uh, what was called a milk bar. It no longer is a milk bar. It's a restaurant now. And this milk bar was the ground floor entrance to uh, the youth center, which is above. And later, as a, uh, as a youngster, you might have had discos or whatever here, uh, and uh, there's an adult education a set of uh, lecture halls here. There's a there's a library here. You could have continued your life spending uh, time, leisure time, reading. And at the end of this sequence of lecture theatres, there is an artist studio. So. Beginning with the, the youth center, which is also, interestingly enough, a, a series of increasing uh, si in rooms in increasing size, this kind of rotational movement. Uh, there's also a rotational movement here, and it culminates in the artist studio. So the suggestion is that this idea of growth, of the ionic uh, motif, is something that generates uh, the overall composition of this building. It's not just an ad hoc uh, assembly of spaces, of program elements, but it's a very carefully calibrated set of building components, each with their own architectural language. So that's um, my presentation in 45 minutes of what I think is a, a structure um, for a theory of architecture.
if you have any questions, I'd be very happy to answer them. And if you have any suggestions, I'd be, I would be even more happy if you have some recommendations. Whether well, you think it's all complete uh, a load of, no, uh, of rubbish, uh, and whether, well, therefore, we really don't need this at all. Thank you very much.